Thank you for listening to this St. Louis on the Air podcast brought to you by Lindenwood University's Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise. Examining market approaches to help solve economic and social issues, Hammond.Institute. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Mars. Today we're taking a closer look at one part of America's history that is not well known. African Americans have played a role in the U.S. military going back to the Revolution. They've participated in all wars since, but as segregated units, until Harry Truman officially integrated the armed forces in 1948. We're focusing today on the legacy of black doughboys, the African American troops who fought in Europe during World War I. That legacy will be the subject of a panel discussion at the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum downtown this Sunday. Joining me in studio is Marshal J. Phillips, a 100-year-old World War II veteran, a participant in the Doughboy panel. Kim Chamberlain is a U.S. Air Force vet from the 1980s, also a participant in that panel. Marvin Alonzo Greer is the Education and Visitor Experience Leader for Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. Thank you all so much for being with us. Great to have you. Thank you for having us. Marvin, let me begin with you. What inspired this particular discussion? We were inspired at the Missouri Historical Society and Soldiers Memorial uh, to focus on this legacy. It was obviously uh, 1919 is when African-American soldiers are coming, and uh, white soldiers as well, are coming home from the First World War. And to really continue this discussion of uh, the First World War and the legacy that black soldiers played up in um, in the post-war years of how they built communities uh, here in St. Louis, how they built communities throughout the country, and the legacies that they left for for future um, African Americans serving in in, uh, in future generations and future wars. Mr. Phillips, uh, you were born the year World War I ended, a good long while ago. How do you feel about uh, the, the legacy was that was left by the African American soldiers in that war? Well, it uh, taught me something about how to live and uh, and try not to suffer like some of them did. Uh-huh. Suffer in what way? Well, uh, inhumane, tr- in being treated unfair, and all of that. Uh-huh. And How were you treated in World War II? Well, in World War II, it was no different. We go to the Post exchange out in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we were mm. taking the basics and uh, call names, and uh, sometimes fights would break out. And then after we got overseas, we was called names, but the soldiers retaliated and would fight, and, and they catch them fighting. They, Go to stock cage. I wouldn't think there'd be much enthusiasm for for fighting in combat uh, with conditions like that amongst your fellow soldiers. Well, um, this was uh, black and white, mm-hmm. and uh, it was segregated, and uh, we didn't have a colored officer. We had all white officers, mm-hmm. and some of them was would live up to uh, what make an officer because we are um, when they when they come and we had to train them <laughs> yeah. and so they didn't do fair with us and um, I knew one 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 officer. And he was our doctor, Fred Lindenfeld. He was in charge of the medics. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they signed him up with our company. And so he went where we went. And he was the best officer I ever seen because he even stayed at his house in Nile, Michigan, and he was a very, very wonderful person. Well, I'm glad that you had that positive experience amidst uh, so much that wasn't quite so positive. Kim, let me turn to you. 
Um, you're a little bit younger than Mr. Phillips. Uh, just a little <laughs> just bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> what has your experience been, and how do you feel that it was influenced at all by those African-American soldiers 100 years ago? I would say overall my experience has been quite positive. Uh, I believe it has more to do uh, with the, le- the leadership, uh, their understanding of a diverse workforce, and how we all come together to meet that mission. My first assignment was in uh, California in a place called Victorville. Um, my superiors, my supervisor, he was from the islands. And so he ensured that, that the work was spread uh, very uh, evenly, gave people opportunity to perform different jobs. So there was a totally team concept um, in the California, I, I flourished quite a bit in, in regards to uh, my rank, uh, position, and title. I would say that once I got to Korea, Osan, Korea, uh, that was a different story. Uh, the person that was in charge um, had a different opinion. Uh, I think it was twofold in that he felt that women had no place in the military, and uh, being a black female made it even more challenging. Two, two strikes. Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, and this was all ev- obviously after the uh, integration of the armed services. Absolutely. 20, Twenty-five years or so. Afterwards. Right, and at the time that mm-hmm. I went in, uh, of course, it was peacetime, so it was a volunteer service. Yeah. Marvin, um, what was life like for the African-American doughboys? Life was uh, challenging. Uh, there, was a, there was opinion for a wide swath of the country that did not believe that African-Americans uh, could serve. I think that's why knowing your history is important uh, because like you said at the beginning of the segment, African-Americans have served in the military from, uh, from the 18th century. Day one. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> from day one of the founding of our country. And so uh, there was a... There was a standing army already. Um, the famous Buffalo Soldiers were, mm-hmm. were, were around the 9th and 10th Cavalry, the 24th and 25th Infantry. Um, but they weren't deployed to, um, and sent to France. Uh, the, there were volunteers and draftees that were African Americans that were sent um, overseas. They were mainly uh, uh, assigned to labor battalions, um, but um, public pressure from, uh, from both the French as well as the African American community saying, uh, from the African-American community, especially in the United States, saying that African-Americans need to be able to prove themselves as equal citizens. You're talking about the nadir t- period where uh, lynchings and, um, mm-hmm. and pogroms or race riots um, are, at its, are, are, are at its height just across the river in East St. Louis. Um, you have um, the East St. Louis race riots. So uh, there is a, a boot on the, on the neck of the African-American community throughout the country, not just in the Deep South, not just in the Midwest, but throughout the country. And so African Americans are living in a in a period of um, economic prosperity. In some cases, they have their own communities; they're able to have businesses. Uh, but at the same time, they are, that se- the segregation uh, prevented them from upward mobility um, in many cases. And so, once they joined the military, it gave African American soldiers a chance to prove their citizenship, approve their worth. Um, eventually. Two um, African American um, divisions, the 92nd and 93rd divisions, are formed, and um, the 93rd division, uh, again, all African American soldiers um, are sent to fight with the French. They wear U.S. uniforms, they wear, um, but they fight with French helmets, French rifles, and under French command. How would you explain the uh, the willingness and the desire to fight to preserve the system that they would face back home? I think that's the paradox of mm-hmm. being African American um, in the military. Uh, you see the same thing from American Revolutionary War soldiers you see, um, that are Af- of African descent. You see the same thing from American Civil War soldiers, uh, Spanish American War soldiers, and World War One soldiers. And again, with Mr. Phillips' generation, World War um, World War Two soldiers, of knowing that your country does not love you, that you're knowing your country does not consider you as a, consider you as a citizen, but still standing up for your uh, for your country. Um, and I think. African Americans define what patriotism is, fighting for your country even when your country doesn't fight for you, um, being able to, to critique your country even when 
uh, and lo having love for your country, even though you know your country does not necessarily have love for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Mr. Phillips' generation inspires me. The World War I generation um, is inspirational. The Civil War generation mm -hmm. is inspirational because these men and women who served in the armed forces, um, uh, they did it in spite of. And I think what better story is there? That is the American story of fighting on um, in spite of. Right. Mr. Phillips, can I ask you to respond to that as well? Fighting for a country you love that doesn't necessarily love you back. Well, when you come up against something like that, where you put out everything that you have within, and you get no love from from your work, mm -hmm. but nevertheless you you do it because you care about your country, mm -hmm. and, and then you say the Bible says, "Love your neighbor as you love yourself." Mm -hmm. So therefore, you just do what the Bible says. And you know the odds are against you, but as long as you do what the Bible says, you will succeed. That that was your guide. The Bible was your guide. Yeah. Yeah. Kim, how about you? It's the same question about about uh, being a part of a, an institution that doesn't and a country that doesn't hold you in the highest esteem. I, I think. Overall, your, your teachings, uh, your values play a big part of that, especially when you live in a society that shows that love or non-caring. I, I can remember having crosses burned on our land, so going into the military wasn't that different often uh, people of color tend to walk two lines. And we've, we've been taught how to live among different people, different cultures, because that's survival for us. Uh, and, and with the military, you would see that as well. Uh, for me, uh, it helped me to adjust and adapt very readily to the military life based on my experiences within the St. Louis area. Do you think the military, you're, you're, you're out of the military affiliation oh, yes. today. Oh, yes. <laughs> but do you think, I'm sure you're an observer of what goes on, as, as we all are, do you think that that has changed? Do you think that today's military is, is fully integrated in every sense of the word? No, yeah. I do not. Mm -hmm. No, I do not. Um, uh, simply because... Well, let me say this first and foremost. What separates an enlisted person from an officer primarily is education, the level of education. Uh, in today's military, we have many enlisted people that are as educated as our officers. So with that being in mind, that's not discriminatory. However, uh, within the military, they have a selection process uh, that they endure, and, and it all appears uh, very on level, but as in anything else, some uh, persons are selected. And so in that selected process, mm -hmm. you're eliminating some others for those opportunities in those positions, I mean, such as women. Only recently have women been able to go into certain positions such as combat, you know, such as logistics, so. It goes beyond race, too, because uh, yes. now sexual orientation is, uh, is, is part of the overall debate, mm -hmm. and there's a certain degree of, uh, of discrimination in that area as well. I mean, the administration wants to pull transgenders, for instance, out of the uh, uh, transgender people out of the equation. Well, in, in the very beginning, it, it was all based on what the person could provide to the military. And it was very clear when you enlisted that that was une unacceptable homosexuality 
period. You will not be serving. There was a concern of riots, how the other persons, military persons, will react towards that person. And then you came through a time of don't ask, don't tell, you know. Uh, so there, there's been a lot of political things involved mm -hmm. with the military and how they treat uh, race, uh, gender, transgender, uh, politics. Uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating, actually. And yet some people say, Marvin, I'll just put this one to you, some people say that perhaps the most integrated element of our society is today's military. Um, in, in some cases, in some cases, yes. Uh, I would also say that the military tends to lead the way in the country in the way of social change. And it may seem difficult to understand that in some ways, but uh, the military integrated before mm -hmm. the rest of the country. Right. Um, when it comes to, um, you mentioned transgender um, individuals, um, and uh, Kim mentioned uh, the LGBT um, community in the military. Um, uh, President Obama, uh, did away with don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. And then I think a few months or a year later, um, uh, the Supreme Court legalized uh, gay marriage. And so seeing that the military allows for the country to uh, to kind of dip its toe in the water and see what's socially acceptable experiment. and experiment um, and see where the country, where the country is leaning. And um, and it acts as a, as a, I'm not sure if it does that intentionally or unintentionally, but looking back historically, it does seem that um, that the military uh, allows for um, an ex uh, as an experimental ground for what is socially acceptable here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mr. Phillips, what do you plan to tell the audience uh, during the panel discussion that you're going to be having uh, this Sunday? Well, we'll tell them how we should live among each other and. Uh, and try to level what the races would be, as you would say, one race. Mm -hmm. and each one be supposed to be created equal, but we still have a good ways to go mm -hmm. to accomplish it. What was your life like after the service? You had a nice career in uh, St. Louis County, I believe it was. Uh, it, was that easy for you? Did you have the same kind of problems uh, in your career? No. Uh, I started at St. Louis University down down a piece at the mm -hmm. around, school. Around the corner here, yeah. And uh, I worked there for 16 years. And the work that I'd done, I learned it from... Uh, one-eyed fellow, which was Caucasian, mm -hmm. and Joe Anthony, and he taught me a whole lot. So in 16 years, and then I was transferred to county hospital pathology, and I was stayed there 32 years, and I went out there as supervisor, and I trained each attendant that I had. It was an e easier life, perhaps, for you than it was in the military. Kim, our time is winding down, but I'd like to ask you the same question. What what message are you going to deliver or want to deliver on Sunday? Uh, on Sunday, I would like uh, to deliver a message of opportunity. I think uh, far too often we shy away from challenges, but challenges is what help you to overcome whatever obstacle you may have, whether that be in education, in housing, in the military. So as a people, we need to forge forward and take on the challenge. How did your military experience inform your life outside of the military? I'm still serving. I am still <laughs> serving, believe it. I am still serving. I, I serve with my women uh, post, post 404. At one time, I was their service officer. I served with other non-for-profit organizations in assisting our veterans in caring for themselves, letting them know of their benefits and how we can help them move forward or have them to be comfortable as they continue to live. Yeah. 
And Marvin, what do you want folks to take away from uh, the Sunday event? I, I'm not sure if uh, Mr. Phillips or Kim said anything that I um, said anything that I couldn't say. Uh, they, I would like I would like guests to walk away with a sense of hist- knowing, um, understanding uh, more of the deeper history, seeing that the military is not a monolith, and that everyone are individuals that make up this the military as well as the country, and to have a greater re- appreciation mm-hmm. for the. The, peop- the people here in St. Louis and the accomplishments um, and the history of, of St. Louisans, especially African-American St. Louisans, uh, that make up the fabric of this community, the metro area, and that have contributed to our great city and our great region and our great country. We, we only have a few seconds left. Another history question. Why do we call them Doughboys? Uh, Doughboys. <laughs> uh, Doughboys comes from uh, the, the history of um, of the the donut, uh, which came which came about from um, women uh, from the American Red Cross that actually made um, uh, made donuts. So that's uh, that's the <laughs> <laughs> yes. that, that's the history we need to know. Well, we're going to have to let it uh, let it stay right there. I want to thank you all so much for being with us. We'll advise folks that the uh, Black Doughboy panel discussion Sunday the tenth at two o'clock in the afternoon at the Soldiers Memorial Military Museum downtown. Thank you all. Marshall J. Phillips, thank you for being with us. Kim Chamberlain, great to see you. Thank you. Marvin Alonzo Greer, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again as well. Thank you. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.